Thanks for continuing on with us. I'm taking over from uh, Nina Rosman and uh, we continue our coverage on the uh, movement of the ringgit. Uh, as of this morning, the ringgit is at 4.55 against one US dollar. Uh, this comes on the back of some of the remarks made by the Prime Minister, also the Minister of Finance yesterday in the Parliament, saying that Malaysia's economy is uh, well under control, inflation is under control and that uh, growth is expected to be quite robust for this year. Here to unpack this and more is Han Liu of Ringgit Plus joining us. Han, uh, what do you make of these uh, movements right now, particularly on the severe weakening of the Ringgit over the past uh, few weeks? Morning, morning, Ibrahim. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, just a bit of context, the Ringgit, you know, had a huge strengthening run from kind of last November to January. We went all the way down to 425 to US dollar at the end of January and has since... Uh, you know, deteriorated over the last three, four months uh, by about 8% to 4.55, as you mentioned. I think the story is not so much uh, domestically. Domestically, the numbers, uh, I don't want to say look good, but I say they look uh, they look uh, uh, much more improved from previous years. Like, uh, you know, uh, 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 inflation was super high last year. This year it's moderated and it's going to be further moderated by end of the uh, year to under 3%. So it's getting close to the 2% target. Um, economic growth is not blockbuster like last year's recovery year, but still moderating right to that 5%, which is what we we're doing pre-COVID. Uh, so I think it's not a case, I guess, uh, uh, of, of too much domestic issues that are uh, causing pressure to the ringgit right now, but, but more so about what's happening with uh, the global economy, right? Namely, um, what's happening with oil, uh, what's happening with the US dollar and rates, and, and what's happening with you know China, uh, and the US in terms of their demand and how we're exporting to them. So I think there's a, a, a huge confluence of factors, not necessarily heavily uh, domestic. And of course, because of these um, factors outside uh, our control, uh, what would be some of the outlook when it comes to uh, the ringgit movement? Uh, do you feel that the ringgit will continue to weaken even further, uh, considering that these external factors are not going to abate anytime soon? Yeah, I think as you know, as a licensed financial planner, advisor, and I, I look after a lot of people's investments now. Um, I, I tell people to look at you know a couple of key things other than the domestic front for Malaysia, right? How do I, uh, what do I need to look at to to kind of get a sense of where the ringgit is heading or where we're heading, right? And the number one thing I guess to look at is is you know the price of oil, right? Uh, Brent specifically, it's down from this time last year. It's in one hundred and twenty dollars a barrel. Now it's seventy five. Uh, you know, Malaysia is a huge, you know, beneficiary of higher oil prices uh, uh, in terms of our export uh, of those items. Um, so, you know, now that, you know, oil is down, you know, 35% year on year, that's going to impact us, uh, impact, you know, the, the amount of oil that we export as a country. We're a heavily exporting country uh, for that. And, you know, uh, you know, I don't need to go too much about Petronas. So that's one thing to look out for. It's now down at 75 barrel. Uh, that's way down from last year. So any further weakening in global demand, impacting the price of oil will definitely have you know second order effects on the ringgit uh second thing i, I you know i tell uh, investors to look at is you know how 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 is the, the health of the global economy uh, uh when it comes to uh, our exports right so how do you look at that you using malaysia's exports as as a barometer and you can see you know like the the april numbers came out last week you know exports are down to china 20 percent down uh, versus last year exports to the us also about 20 percent down so you can see, hey, we had a great export year last year. It's starting to 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 look like it's I don't want to say running out of steam, uh, but starting to slow down. And as you know, you know the, the export the less we're able to you know defend our currency with uh, exported money, right? Sorry, exported goods getting getting things like US dollars, uh, yen, and, and and you know uh, euros into the into the country, right, to defend the ringgit. So I think that's kind of a few things to look at, right, in terms of forecasting or looking at uh, in terms of the ringgit. Okay, uh, I have to ask this question, though I don't believe it myself. Uh, political risk is uh, uh, something that we need to uh, uh, debate on, at least uh, in the next few minutes. Um, if I can just um, insert uh, this particular graphic that uh, my colleague has just uh, presented a few minutes ago, Nina. Um, we can just end this graphic right now. Yep, there you go. Um, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim assumed uh, the Prime Ministerial Office on the 24th of uh, November. And as you can see, from 23rd November onwards, the ringgit strengthened quite considerably um, to a point of, say, 4.2, 4.25, something like that. And then, of course, it's weakening again. Does the weakening or the strengthening of the ringgit have anything to do with amendment? 
mandate on how this administration is running its affairs? Is this a, a referendum of sorts in terms of uh, Anwar Ibrahim's capability in leading this government? Um, I, I, I don't have a specific political viewpoint, but what I can share is that uh, uh, markets and investors hate uncertainty. And you can see, you know, uh, about a year ago, a growing, growing uncertainty about the political stability of our country impacting the ringgit. Alongside, obviously, the, all the factors from last year around the US dollar's tightening cycle, right? Ready, ready, heading up to November. Uh, up During November, you know, there was a one-time, you know, elimination of, uh, as it were, of the uncertainty around what's happening with Malaysia politically. We had an election. We had a, a unclear result from a political standpoint, but from a fiscal governmental standpoint, it was, it was fairly clear, right? There was a government to be formed. Uh, rather than no government, that would have been uh, disastrous. And that gave investors confidence that, hey, there is a government, it's going to, uh, 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 you know, uh, the election was held, there is a government, so, you know, let's get back to business, essentially. And and now, I think th there's a bit of challenge for, you know, the, the the government we have today. It's not so much around a referendum, the, the ringgit being a referendum, right? We have headwinds globally, right? And the performance ringgit is largely, I would say, two-thirds to 80% driven by those global factors. Uh, uh, the remaining, yes, I think, uh, you know, the, the Prime Minister and the government have a lot on their hands to deal with to, I don't say defend the ringgit, but to ensure that, uh, you know, we, we, we keep the market confident in our country, right? We keep the market confident in the political stability of our country without kind of uh, uh, delaying the, the state elections too much, without worrying too much kind of stuff. I just get it done, right? And continue governing, continue sound policies, uh, which, you know, can allow us to respond somewhat to those global factors, right? Without that, that's going to cause further pressure on the ringgit. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the global factors then because the markets currently are awaiting the minutes of the latest uh, FOMC meeting that is due tomorrow. Markets are pricing in a 68.68% chance of rates being held steady next month and another 31.4% chance that a 25 basis point hike is going to take place. Uh, this is of course a CME Fed watch tool has shown. Uh, because of this, do you feel that the upcoming US Federal Reserve interest rate is going to impact further the movement of the ringgit and uh, to a large extent, the way uh, in domestic investments, sorry, uh, investments are going to be attracted uh, for domestic purposes right now. A good question. I think um, you know all eyes on that, right? Uh, in terms of what's a posturing, right? Whether they are going to further raise, uh, uh, whether they're going to stop here, and even if they do stop here, one thing that investors need to note is how long do they stop for? Because rates are at a kind of fifteen-year high. Uh, 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 you know, in pre in financial crisis, in the uh, 08 financial crisis, right? They're, you know, well over 5% now in terms of the Fed funds rate. Uh, and, and you look at that kind of uh, it going the, the next month or so. I think the more important thing also to look at is uh, not so much the FOMC, but, you know, politically, is are the US going to solve this debt ceiling issue? If they don't, that, that's going to be a big, big amount of volatility in the market, a lot of risk off the table. And, you know, risk off the table means emerging markets suffer because we, we're seen as higher risk, higher return countries. So risk off means, you know, we're going to suffer in terms of foreign flood outflows because there's going to be a flight to safe uh, uh, somewhere. It may not be. Yeah, sorry, we, we kind of lost you uh, a bit uh, in patches there. Um, uh, let's look at uh, the role of uh, domestic investors here in Malaysia. Um, ETFs seem to be hot right now uh, when it comes to uh, trying to find investment uh, when it comes to uh, investing or growing your investment. Uh, we're looking at because of the uh, US dollar uh, being so high against the ringgit, uh, now would be a good time to start looking at investments uh, internationally, at least for retail investors, folks like me, like you. Uh, do you think that this uh, kind of thinking is uh, uh, the right way of thinking or do you, is, are, is there more nuance to this kind of, uh, of, uh, of line of argument right now uh, a great great line of argument i think um, i mean all investors should look to diversify and most people when they say diversify they think okay buy more than one stock or buy stocks plus bonds but when i say diversify i also mean across uh, uh across countries and currencies right if you don't do that uh, 
if you're leaving yourself at risk to a specific country. Now, we live in Malaysia, so it's probably more than okay if we have a lot of allocation to Malaysia, but diversification means you've got to look elsewhere. Uh, you know, uh, uh, global stocks, US stocks, global bonds, US bonds, international bonds, right? Just to diversify your own portfolio and not necessarily as a trigger because, you know, where the ringgit specifically going. It's more around uh, making sure you have more exposure. So the, the nuance is, yes, you should be looking uh, overseas for a part of a portfolio, but probably not do, uh, do it only as a result of, you know, seeing, uh, you know, where the ringgit is going, uh, whether it's up or down. I think it, sh it should just be always a part of your portfolio. Anyway, and don't worry too much about it, uh, 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 you know, in the investment perspective. Uh, very recently yesterday, uh, the Prime Minister made a few announcements uh, in the um, Parliament, including that on uh, uh, the 1MDB solution, for instance. Uh, he's uh, talking about how Malaysia is going to discuss findings with the 1MDB solutions with Abu Dhabi. Uh, he also made, mentioned that there would be no more subsidies for T20, uh, including that of no electricity uh, tariff hike except for T20 households. So, uh, you know, we're looking at the government actively trying to see how they can manage the subsidy bill uh, for the government, at least for the budget 2024 that's going to be expected to be presented in just a few months from now. Uh, because of this, do you feel that there would be market jitters in terms of how investors are going to look at Malaysia managing its fiscal affairs and how T20 is going to react to these kind of postulations by the Prime Minister after making such statements in the Parliament? How do you see uh, the uh, investors reading these kind of uh, 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 remarks made by the Prime Minister yesterday in the Parliament? Yeah, I, uh, again, I think the Prime Minister was right to highlight these things. I think just to give a little more context to, you know, your viewers, right, 1MD will be, you know, has been an issue for our country for the last seven, eight years in terms of our, the, the, the market view or the global market view on Malaysia. Uh, we're coming to the tail end of it. What I mean by that is, you know, uh, a large majority of the 1MDB debt has been, uh, I want to say, repaid or settled uh, um, and with a little bit to go. Uh, uh, the big payment was kind of early this year. Um, and uh, uh, we we have probably about nine or ten billion left uh, uh, versus kind of like a, a forty to fifty billion dollar uh, hole, right? And uh, that should allow us a little bit more fiscal space. It has been very fiscally fiscally constraining the last kind of three years or so in terms of having to repay that debt and considering it as development expenses without actually having any development done because it was all for past transgressions, right? But going forward, you know, there sh that going away or that not being in the rear view mirror should give a little bit more fiscal space to the government. And it, it shows in the budget, right? They're, they're having to spend less on 1MDB repayments uh, in the coming year. Uh, uh, and they're forecasting a lot less in 2024 as well. Uh, so that should help, right? Um, in terms of confidence in our fiscal position. All right. And when it comes to subsidies, it's huge. It's, you know, Every year, the size of 1MDB, the last three years, right, like 50, 60 billion. I think in the in budget 2023, it was at 57 billion. And the government is looking to, I would say, do the low-hanging fruit first, right? So first, the the, the corporate uh, uh, electricity subsidies, then they're going to go with, with diesel, then the big one, which is, you know, RON 95, right? I think that's kind of going to, that's going to be a bit... Shocking, I would say, to uh, the, the Malaysians as a whole. But we need to do something, and uh, uh, it's better than doing nothing, right? To you know, kind of really enhance or fix our fiscal position even further, uh, and be a more responsible nation. I think uh, the personally, the easiest way would be to kind of uh, uh, take the bandit off and then provide some some aid directly to those who need it most. But that's just my opinion. I think uh, it remains to be seen what the government actually does, what mechanism they actually have to remove those subsidies. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's the that's the idea right now. I mean, uh, your view uh, is is precisely that. Your view, uh, in fact, uh, one would argue that uh, the uh, current uh, consensus right now is that there is, there exists some form of political stability in Malaysia vis-à-vis uh, uh, -vis the past few years. Also, economic policies, uh, for better or worse, are clear. Uh, and because of the political stability and economic policies that are clear, this has made the argument that uh, investment growth for the first quarter um, have led to encouraging levels. And the Prime Minister has indeed said as much. Yes, in the Parliament, uh, he said that approved investments for the first quarter of this year totaled 71.4 billion ringgit. 
This is a 60% increase from the 44 billion ringgit recorded in the first quarter of last year. Um, the Prime Minister also cited that AWS uh, plans to invest 25 billion ringgit, 25 and a half actually, um, as well as investments from Tesla, for instance, in EV, um, China based Rongshan Petrochemicals uh, Limited in petrochemical products, and Geely and Proton uh, trying to grow their business in Tanjung Malim uh, in their automotive city. So, because of all this, the Prime Minister also said that the economic policies before were confusing but Malaysia's economic growth would not have outpaced those of, say, Indonesia, Vietnam and China, the markets that we always talk about that tends to outdo Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia's economy grew by 5.6% for the first quarter of this year. The better than performance uh, such as countries like Indonesia, China and Vietnam is indeed quite promising for the first quarter. But if you look at the longer term, maybe the past 10 quarters, uh, Malaysia still is lagging behind. Uh, this growth is also stronger than Menengara's forecast between 4.0 to 5.0 for this year. So because of this, do you feel that there's some encouraging signs for Malaysia when it comes to growing the economy for this year? And then of course, the, the tack on question is Is it, uh, uh, are you fearful or are you uh, uh, a little bit more pessimistic uh, because uh, this strong growth might lead to unwanted, unwanted uh, side effects like inflation and many others? How do you see Malaysia's growth in the next few quarters and what does it mean for folks like you and me at the retail level? That's a, that's a big, there's a lot in there. I think um, uh, where I see uh, things headed, um, um, it, the, the number one word to use is moderation. And the number two word that I, I want to use is um, global impact, right? So moderation meaning, you know, we had a very, very shocking 2020, 21 uh, due to COVID, right? And we had a huge recovery in 2022 due to a low base effect. We're starting to see that moderate now. Right. And we're going to see further moderation in Q2 and Q3. Why do I say that? Because last year we had, you know, a big lift up, not just of the recovery, but from uh, uh, from uh, I want to say uh, indirect fiscal stimulus due to you know, EPF withdrawals in uh, April and May last year, which we're not going to have this year. One thinks uh, and that that was an impact that lasted several months, right, from Q2 and into Q3. So you're going to see that moderate. Right. I'm going to see a lower a level of growth. Uh, particularly on the services or the wholesale and retail trade side, which gonna, is going to push, uh, uh, you know, GDP growth down, uh, uh, um, you know, that's certainly below Q, or Q1 levels. Uh, we're, we're, I don't think we're going to see 5.6 the next couple of quarters. So that's one thing to note. Um, but more importantly, or equally importantly, is uh, how the global economy is doing, right? Uh, exports dropping to China and, and US dropping by 20% year on year is large, right? And these are our key markets in terms of, you know, importing and exporting trade of uh, electronics, which is a big sector for us, uh, uh, chemicals, huge sector for us, all of which, uh, all these sectors are down year on year. Um, so that's going to be what I say just now, global impact, right? So the first thing to note for, for, for folks looking at GDP, you're going to see it moderate, mainly due to the huge uh, uh, base effect from last year. Uh, but second, we're going to have to watch for for kind of uh, global deterioration uh, in demand, right, for our products, right? And if, if those continue to deteriorate, um, I don't say there's nothing that we can do, right? The government needs to put in policies that kind of shield us from these things. Uh, and if they, it looks like they're doing it and they just need to continue doing it and continue being consistent with attracting high quality investments. You mentioned Tesla, you mentioned uh, Amazon, right? These, are, these should be designed to be high quality investments, which gives us a small solid footing to withstand all these pressures, right? So that's what... That's what I think. Uh, there's also the execution risk, actually, um, Han, because uh, while we tend to uh, succeed very well at that uh, in terms of uh, making these landmark decisions or, or flagship decisions uh, and announcements, uh, the follow-through work might not necessarily translate uh, in the initial idea of how much investments are going to come in. Um, how worried are you when it comes to execution risk, uh, particularly from the rank and file, from the uh, regulatory aspect um, and, and many more. I, in fact, I just met one uh, nice individual uh, from uh, the UK um, and he was talking about how setting up a business in Malaysia, especially for a Brit, is not necessarily as easy as he thought. So that, that is, uh, and he co was comparing it against the UK uh, businesses and how it's quite fairly easy uh, for, uh, non, uh, for a foreigner to set up business in the UK. That's just one pedestrian view, I suppose. But generally speaking, I've kind of heard, uh, heard these kind of views again and again. So how, do, how worried are you when it comes to execution risk in trying to realise these kind of investments and growth uh, for the country? Mm, I think... 
you know, at Malaysians, we, we read the headline numbers, right? Which is, you know, amazing amount, you know, 150 billion, 170 billion approved investments. Uh, and then there's announcement of who's been investing, who's doing the investing. But I think if you look at the track record of, of uh, approved, actually realized investments, it's somewhere in the region of kind of 25 to 40% of the announced number, right? I, I don't want to say specifically which 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 administration did what percent. It's it's that's that's not the, the focus. The focus is you don't always get your entire approved investments um, due to various things, which is not just Malaysia things. It could be a change of direction at the company after a couple of years, that, that kind of thing. So you typically see somewhere between a quarter to a half of those approved investments actually materialize. I think that the onus is on uh, you know folks like Maida, folks like Miti to you know, not handhold, but to ensure that those guys who you know we spend so much effort to 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 coax or to persuade or to convince to invest in Malaysia actually do so you know uh, you know follow up with them on a regular basis do what you do best right and uh, and for me it's a, it's a case of making sure that we are seen uh, as a place of uh, stability safety in a kind of a, a very tense geopolitical situation globally where you know we position ourselves as neutral open for business and you know to be fair to to us you know Mal uh, Malaysia was ranked you know I think top top 15 I think it was 12th on the list of you know global easiest places to do business, um, it is easy to set up a company here. Might not be so easy to do certain businesses here due to certain regulations. But in terms of setting up a company, uh, it's pretty easy to do so. In terms of setting up uh, you know a general business, it's easy to do so. Perhaps certain business lines have a little bit more red tape than others. Okay, uh, let's now tap into your uh, particular skill of uh, being the certified financial planner that you are. Um, uh, the, uh, I guess, uh, um, uh, allure for investors to start taking up uh, risky investments is there. Um, in fact, uh, some of my friends are asking me about uh, you know, investing in uh, 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 Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, they're thinking about trying to invest in um, a very short uh, uh, but actually highly lucrative kind of uh, type of investments. Uh, maybe you can share with us uh, the age-old view of how uh, we should invest, particularly at a time when we are seeing debt rising faster than income. Uh, what would be some of the ideas that you have right now, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, folks, uh, regular Malaysians that might not necessarily have uh, the kind of disposable income today as they had before? Yeah, I think, uh, um, you know, the age old uh, question around uh, risk versus return comes to play, right? Um, um, you mentioned a few things there, right? Um, I'll split that up into a few things. Number one, if you hear about an opportunity, which is uh, which sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? Something that said, tells you guaranteed return, it's a high risk, a high return, but don't worry, it's guaranteed. Um, that's, that, that doesn't sound like a, 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 a genuine investment to me. It's kind of good, too good to be true um, with with uh, Bitcoin alternative assets, um, specifically cryptocurrencies uh, and Bitcoin and Ethereum and things like that, um, they are what they are, right? They, 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 they are high risk investments, high volatility, but very importantly to an investor and you know, as an investment advisor, I say this all the time, um, high volatility can be your friend, right? Especially if it's an asset class, which is not very correlated to uh, other asset classes. For example, like uh, you know, price of Bitcoin or Ethereum is generally not correlated to anything it's really uh, uh, um, uh, its own asset class and that has a purpose that can have a purpose in a portfolio right but beware of that high volatility you know moderate it you within your portfolio keep it keep it as a very small percentage of your portfolio just as a you know a, a, a topping up or, or uh, allowing you to top up those returns without taking on too much risk right just beware of the volatility uh, it's become a mainstream asset class Use regulated platforms. Be careful of folks telling you to invest. Hey, invest in my my thing over here. It's unregulated. It's unlicensed. Uh, use licensed platforms by the SC um, to to invest in these things. But and beware of the volatility. Make sure it's nice and measured within your portfolio. What about gold prices? I've seen gold prices fluctuating, rebounding quite uh, uh, dramatically uh, ahead of the FOMC. Some people are thinking about gold as an investment to hedge off other types of assets right now. What's your view on that? Hmm. Yeah, I think um, the one thing about gold and um, one thing that's missed in the gold narrative is that over the last decade or so, and it has accelerated the last 24 months, is central banks globally buying gold, right? And and you've got to ask yourself, why are they doing this, right? And why are they buying gold in large and large amounts? I'm talking tons and tons of gold, uh, literal tons. Um, and part of the reason is, number one, a little fear on 
uh, uh, U.S. monetary and fiscal policy. So that's one, right? If, if something bad happens with the U.S. dollar, I need a hedge, right? And gold is a pretty good hedge against that. Uh, but the other part is also around uh, sovereignty, right? If I have the gold, I have the value sitting in my vault uh, and not in somebody else's currency. I think that's kind of another big thing. So that that is your play for also an investor, right? Now, gold, just like Bitcoin, does not have any specific uh, 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 economic value beyond that, right? It's still useful, uh, but just keep in mind that, you know, it's, it's more of a hedge, it's more of an insurance policy. And then the question is, what are you insuring against? You're insuring against a couple of things. Number one, any risk to the US dollar, right? In terms of monetary debasement, in terms of exporting their inflation, in terms of failure of the currency, you know, I'm not allowed to say that kind of thing, but failure of the currency of the US dollar, you have something like gold uh, and or Bitcoin, uh, which are not necessarily correlated to, to those things. They're not under the control of anyone. Uh, so that's useful stuff. But, you know, you won't put your whole uh, portfolio into an insurance contract, right? You put a little bit just to make sure you're well insured, right? And then you you remain with the rest of your portfolio, equities, bonds, right? So you have equities, bonds, a little bit of gold, a little bit of Bitcoin. You know, that feels like a nice balanced portfolio. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, Han, uh, for speaking with us this morning. That was Han Liu, the co-founder and a director of Ringgit Plus. Uh, there are some uh, developments uh, domestically as well in terms of uh, political news. Uh, the uh, parliament is going to be uh, going on uh, for the next uh, few uh, days ahead of us. And of course, part of the agenda is trying to clear out some of the uh, bills uh, that uh, the MPs have indeed uh, been presenting and waiting uh, for the parliament to approve. One such key uh, uh, approval was uh, the uh, decriminalization of uh, suicide. Um, another one is on the improvement of Mental Health Act. Uh, so these are the kind of uh, laws that uh, many observers outside of the political spectrum as well as, well as outside of the business circles are actually uh, thinking about and looking at. So uh, do stay tuned with Esra Awani in terms of how we are going to cover the uh, proceedings of the parliament in the next few days. Uh, but for now, my name is Ibrahim Sani. Have a great one ahead of you. Thank you.